you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We'll get to that in just a few moments. In our cover-to-cover series, I've tried to have been faithful in presenting not just what's happening in the individual events in the Old Testament, but ultimately what they pointed to. Because all of history, from the beginning, before the beginning of time, up until now, has, has pointed to the event at the cross. And everything from the point of his death on the cross afterwards points in reverse. This becomes the key pinnacle moment of, of what God is doing to intersect from heaven down to humanity that he's created. John 1 and in and, and verse 1 talks about how that Jesus is the Word, and the Word was with God from the very beginning. This wasn't plan B, this is plan A. This is what God's plan has, has been all along. And so we now have Jesus on the cross, and as he gives up his, his last breath and says, it is finished, he has completed what God has designed for him to do long before he created man. Well, after his death, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were told, took down the body of Jesus, and they prepared it with, with spices and, and, and wrapped it in linen and, and put it into uh, a, a new grave that had been crafted close to the garden. And so as they're doing this, and, and they place his body in there, the day that he's in there, uh, the Jews spent their day resting and in worship. And later, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread would be understood to symbolize that the Lord's body was was there and, as prophesied, would not decay in the grave. So the Jews would have later understood this in a new way when comparing it to this feast. And then we have the excitement that takes place on the third day. And that the text tells us that that Jesus arose before the women came into the tomb. So at, at the very point that people are, are taking the first fruit offerings to the temple. And as they're lining up to go in, what, what do they see? Well, they see that the curtain has been torn from top to bottom. Things are not as they're supposed to be. And all this is happening. And, and as they're coming to bring their first fruits offering, so is the Lord. And so we have this in, incredible thing that takes place. When, when Jesus was raising from the dead, so were others. The the graves were open, the text tells us, when when Jesus died upon the cross, but they didn't come out until he came out. In in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51, it says this, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the, the holy city and appeared to many. Can you imagine this? Those of you who are into zombies, it's here. This is happening. Dead people are walking on the face of the earth. So what God is saying is, I have given you my Passover lamb. And this is not like any ordinary lamb. And let's see what this means. Now that he's rested and he's come back as he prophesied. Jesus talked about, as we studied in the, in the story of Jericho, when he goes in there to talk with, with Zacchaeus, Right before he goes in, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be flogged. And I'm going to give my life as a ransom to many. And now it's happening. And the first fruits of this is Jesus has been raised from the dead. And it's almost like God is peeling back the heavens and saying, look what I can do. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20 says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He said, if you're worried about death, you're worried about what comes next, you don't have to. If you're united with Jesus Christ, look at what the power that's been made available through His heavenly Father and the power of the Spirit to raise the dead. All He's asking is that we be united with Him. Okay, well that gets us through our first three of, of the feast. We have the feast of a Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits, boom, boom, boom. All those have been brought forward and hopefully reframed through the lens of Jesus Christ. What about that last one, uh, Shabbat, the feast of weeks, uh, 50 days later? Well, b- between this last feast and the next one, Jesus appears to his disciples for how many days? 
40 days. And then before he's ascended, he says, I want you going to Jerusalem and wait. And so you imagine these type A guys are ready to go. And what do you want us to do? Why don't you go and wait? <sighs> okay. And so he tells them to go. And so they go into the upper room. And, and now this group is, is, is larger. It's, it's not just the 12, I mean, 120. They're all crammed in there going, what do we do now? I don't know. Jesus said to wait. And then on that 10th day, 10 days later, after they've been in this upper room, the Holy Spirit came on Shabano. Pentecost in the Greek, meaning 50 days. Came right on this feast. Before we talk about the events that took place on that day, I want us to back up. Back up to the first Pentecost. There at the base of Mount Sinai, the people gathered and they witnessed God coming down from heaven to be among his people, his presence there with the smoke and the fire and, and, and the peals of, of thunder and the burst of lightning. And God's awesome presence is among them. And he's revealing to them how much he loved them by, by saving them out of Egypt. And now they're, they're going to be coming together. And as Moses goes up on the mountain, and he's there to, to receive this commandment, so the Torah, what's going on at the foot of the mountain? Well, the, the people know they can't go up on it. And, and that death is certainly to follow if they even touch it. You know, you know there's some teams, I like, dare you, double dog dare you. No, you, you can't go up on the mountain. It's God's holy mountain, and so they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And finally, the people are like, I'm not sure Moses is coming down. We saw the destruction that was happening, the earthquakes and, and the lightning and all the storm. Maybe he perished in the storm. And so they get together, and they say, Aaron, make us a God that we can worship. This is too far. It's too abstract. And so they gather together their plunder, and they craft this golden calf can't imagine this has taken place and we see that when the golden calf is done the people are engaged in all kinds of pagan reverently like their their gentile neighbors around them and they're worshiping this idol they haven't even read the ten commandments and they're already breaking most of them just in this, this one feast and, and moses then walks down and and joshua this with him he's like it sounds like there's war going on in the camp he goes that's not the sound of war it's the sound of a celebration, of singing, of a party. So he walks in on this, and he throws down the tablets in disgust and breaks them and demands that those that are with the Lord, it's almost like he draws a line and saying, he said, come over to him. And the Levites were the first to say, we want to know part of this. And they come and rally around him. And so did others that, that were witnessing these things that said, we're with the Lord, we're not with them. There was a group that says, no, we're good. We, we kind of like what's happening here. Not only the golden calf, we like this worship and kind of this lifestyle. And so Moses says, for those that wouldn't come over and align themselves with the Lord, he tells the Levites, get, get, get your swords on. Get your swords on. I, I know they're your brothers. I know they're your sisters and your cousins. You've got to walk through. It says that day in Exodus 32 and verse 20, that 28 the Levites did as Moses commanded and that day about 3,000 of the people died and it sounds harsh but under the law they were guilty I, I know they hadn't read it but they had come before God and said we're going to covenant with you and just as the covenant has been released they're already breaking it saying we're, we don't even know if we want to covenant with you anymore and so they had rejected the God that had rescued them from Egypt in response to this covenant relationship with Sinai, they said, we don't want to live under the terms of that covenant. Well, let's see what can be gleaned by comparing those events to the events that transpired 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4 says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, like a blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues and as the Spirit enabled them. Can you imagine all this is going on? 
it sounds a lot like the first Pentecost, God coming and, and, and being a part of them. And so in the first one, we see God descends a great fanfare on, on Sinai with wind. And, and, and now he has this same fanfare with, with the wind and the tongues of fire that are landing on his disciples. And so God descended Mount Sinai to take up residence among his people. And on this day, God takes up residence within his people. Just incredible. Not only to have God there, but to have God within you. That's the power of the Spirit. That's what transpires on this. And of course, all this commotion attracts quite a commotion. And, and so people within the city are like, what is happening? And so they start gathering, coming to see what's happening. In Acts 2 and verse 14, it says, fellow Jews, all of you here in Jerusalem that, that have heard some stuff going on and, and, and maybe are, are wondering what's happening, he said, let me explain it to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as some of you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, if it was ten, no. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my sermons, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. What he's saying is, you are students of the word. You read about the power of God. You know what the, what the prophets have been telling you from, from, from far away. And for many years, you studied this stuff. Do you believe in the power of God or not? Joel said this day was going to come. And now it's here. And now that you see it, you're not connecting the power of God with what's happening on your everyday life. It's almost like they're, they're two separate worlds where we have this religious world and we believe in the power of God, but not my everyday troubles. He said, you've got to pull those things together. You've got to see what God is doing among us this day. And so the people listen intently as Peter explained to them the plan that God had and he's had all along to send his son on their behalf. And so it starts setting in. Oh, that's who he was very man they were complicit in putting to death acts 2 and verse 37 says this when the people heard this what god had done on their behalf and how they acted they were cut to the heart and they said to peter and the other apostles brothers what should we do peter replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the holy spirit what was their response? Acts 2 and verse 41 says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about how many? 3,000 were added that to the number that day. See, the Feast of Pentecost through the Old Testament was a celebration of God giving the law on Mount Sinai. But after he gave them the law under it, man, but after God gave the law at the, at, there at, at Sinai, the people experience death. But now he gives them the law at this, at, at here, and you, you have it in the book of Acts when they understand that it's not just the law, but he's also giving the spirit, and he's given the sacrifice to make it possible to live under law. It brings about life, and 3,000 people were saved. When it was just the law alone, 3,000 were put to the sword. It changes everything. Everything in, in our understanding of who God is and how we respond to him. And, and, and Peter is laying out in his sermon the, the crucial event of, of all the times is what Jesus did upon the cross. And really he gives us two reasons, two things that put Jesus upon the cross. The first is it was God's plan. It was God's plan. Acts 2 and verse 22 says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. This may appear to you that this story is a tragedy. You know what happened upon the cross. You were witness to these events 50 days ago. And you may think, man... That was really a tragedy. But in reality, it's in God's plan. God has, 
knew this day was coming, and God sent his son anyway to be a part of this. So God has set this plan in motion from the beginning of time, and the set intentions of the plan were to fulfill the law and bring us back to him in right relationship. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 2 through 6 says, You yourselves are our letter. Paul's writing to him, Written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. This is what we have in, in Christ. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone like Moses had, that it, as he brought before the people to condemn them, but on the tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this in ours from Christ before God. Not that we are, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. We're, we're still struggling humans. But our competence comes from God and what he's done with Jesus on the cross. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. That is good news. Do we understand that? We have a new way of coming in. I'm so glad that we're on this side of the cross. I'm so glad that Jesus has died for each and every one of us. I'm so glad that when God sees us, he has to look through Jesus and his sacrifice and that we have the power of the Spirit that's coursing through our veins and driving us and helping us. God's plan along was to satisfy the letter of the law through the sacrifice of Jesus once and for all on the cross. In Acts chapter 2, in the Feast of Pentecost, Mark this new covenant fulfillment. And so we, we have the Spirit come in. It's replaced the law. And then believers answer the Lord, not through their own actions, but through the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus. And now, instead of somehow futilely trying to live up to, to the letter of the law like the Pharisees were doing, he said, you can't. Now we go through Jesus Christ. And now we go through that sacrifice, our Passover lamb. Acts 2 and verse uh, 23, the second part of this reveals the second thing that put Jesus upon the cross, and that was our sin. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him upon the cross. It wasn't just that it was God's plan, but it was also the sin of those that were there. See, the crowd that was gathered on this Pentecost there in, in Jerusalem were the ones that had been there on Palm Sunday that were yelling, Hosanna laying their branches and saying, we're with you. You're our king. As long as you are the king that we want you to be. But when he wasn't, they took a step back and they started questioning, started distancing themselves. And finally, they joined the, the chorus there in the crowds that are yelling, crucify. And Peter is saying, you are the ones that put him upon the cross. And it cut them to the quick. They say, how do we do this? But those that were gathered stood guilty of the death of Jesus. The blood was on their hands. He said, our sin, the breaking of the law, brought separation and entity. And the things that we've done, because we've all have, have fallen short of the glory of God, and because of that, it necessitated the Lord sending his son, Jesus, on our behalf. So we're all guilty of that. It's his plan and our sin put his son upon the cross and if we're living without following Jesus, it, it, it following his example, and if we're trying to do it of our own power, does that work? It, it, it doesn't. That line of thinking and, and trying to just be better than the guy next to us, it leads to death. There's going to be death in our marriages. There's going to be death in our parenting, in our ministry death in our health and death in our career if it's all under, under our own power because we're fallen people in a fallen world. We simply can't be good enough is what this passage tells us. So we stand there with the same guilt as those that were assembled there in Jerusalem. So we have to figure out what to do. We can't measure up. So we have to depend upon Jesus and depend on the Spirit of God and His grace that was extended. Because if we do that, that's where it leads to salvation. That's where it leads to change life. Paul says, once I understood who Jesus was on my experience on the road to Damascus, 
my whole life looked totally different because I sacrificed, I, I understood the sacrifice of Jesus and how my life and my actions, though I thought were righteous, were damaging to the cause of Christ. He said, I abandoned it all. And I realized I became the chief of sinners in need of the cross. I thought I was righteous doing everything according to the law, but I realized that that was futile. It's futility. I have to align myself with Jesus Christ. And now, through the spirit that has been given when he was baptized, he said, let me tell you what that life looks like. To the church at Galatia, in Galatians chapter 5, he says, now when I have the Holy Spirit, these are some things that are starting to come out. Stuff that, that normal people don't have because they can't do it under their own willpower. Tangible life change because of the spirit that's in my life. Jeremiah 31 and verse 34, the prophet kind of laid out what this new life in the covenant would be. He says, it's a covenant that wipes the slate clean. Isn't this good news? It provides forgiveness for our wickedness. And he said, all the sins that we've had that have been written on this slate, all that is remembered no more because of what Jesus has done for us. So we marry these two ideas together. God has a plan. He wants us back. And the only way to, to realize that plan is through Jesus Christ, and we have a need. Everything that we try to do, even, we just can't be good enough. We've got to have Jesus Christ. So we married those two things together. You know, those that were standing there were able to put that two together. I said, what do we have to do? How do we realize this gift and how we receive Jesus Christ? It's repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, that's how you do it. And so this morning, like on the morning of the day of Pentecost, we're offered the same invitation. And it's the same invitation that Moses offered to the people then. You can continue in your way of operating, going by the way that you see fit, or you can come and align yourself with God. Come and choose life. So that's what he asked us to do, to walk over the side of the Lord through the sacrifice of Jesus, washing away our sins forever and agreeing to walk with him in newness of life. If that's what you're looking for this morning, we would love, like on the day of Pentecost, to have all those that are in need come before their Heavenly Father and accept Jesus in the waters of baptism. Whatever your needs are, we ask you to come now as we stand and sing. Oh.